Do you ever have this problem when you're drawing? You're drawing the side of a building in perspective. Now this particular building has seven windows and you need to make sure you draw all seven. So you know that with perspective, the top and the bottom lines are going to be angling towards each other. And you know that the windows need to fit into these perspective lines as well. Now you do know about foreshortening. You do know that there's meant to be some sort of visual compression as things move further away from us. And because the side of this building is sloping away from us, there needs to be some sort of visual compression, some sort of narrowing of the things we see. But it's not so easy to do in real life as it sounds in theory. And we still have to get these seven windows in. So working pretty hard and I'm working out how long the building is by how many windows I draw. And here at last are the seven windows. But you know, it's not looking quite right. One good way of checking to see whether we've got this right is to check the proportions of our windows. See that first window is tall and rectangular. And if we color in with a red pen, it becomes more obvious what's happening with the proportions. So let's compare that first and last window, can we? The first window is nice and rectangular, allowing for the perspective angles at the top and bottom. But when we compare it with that last, that seventh window, it's a lot squarer in shape. So somehow we've not kept in able to keep the proportions correct as we've foreshortened. Is there some way we can do this accurately and know just how much we need to compress things? Is there some perhaps more mathematical way? So let's try again. I'm going to start by drawing the left hand corner of the building. Now I want seven windows, so I need seven divisions. So I'm just going to mark this wall off into seven equal parts. Now I need to add an eye level and get a vanishing point. So I'll just put the vanishing point there. And I'm going to join this vanishing point, not just with the top and bottom of the line for the wall, but also for the seven divisions. The other important thing to notice is that I don't let the windows decide where the wall ends. I actually plot where I want the wall to end. And now I'm going to make the windows fit into that space with the correct proportions. I put the diagonal of the wall in place. And now I join each of those equal seven divisions down the height of the wall with the vanishing point. And I mark where they cross the diagonal. And now I do a vertical line down them. And that gives me seven equal spaces down the length of the wall that are proportioned according to the appropriate foreshortening for this wall at this angle. And on the second and fifth divisions, I'm going to sit a window between them. And I'm going to continue doing that between these perspective lines. And because the lines are closer and closer, the windows will be narrower and narrower. And I'm also being careful that I make slightly less gap between the window and the pencil line because it's not just the windows that become narrower, but the gaps between them become narrower as well. So now I have seven windows, but this looks a lot more correct, doesn't it? And we add some red just to make it a little more emphasized. The foreshortening, the visual compression, the narrowing of things as they get further away, we can see that each window becomes narrower the further away it goes from us and the gap between them gets narrower. And that's what we're after in foreshortening. So let's try a more extreme example just to show that it works for any angle. Now, of course, I don't need to divide this into seven equal parts. It could be four, it could be 12. It just depends how many items that we need. I'm making the eye level a lot higher than in our first example. I put the diagonal line in and I mark where it crosses the line 
join in each of these seven divisions with my vanishing point. And now I again put these vertical lines in. And we can see that they end up being much closer together than in the example above. Again, we'll put the windows between the second and the fifth lines. And again, we'll add some red ink just to emphasize exactly what's window. And again, we can see that they line up looking right, looking as if they're real. A good way to compare the effectiveness of what we've drawn to see whether we're getting it right or getting it wrong is to add some figures all the way along our wall. Because if we've got our proportions correct, then the figures should look as though they go with our wall and our windows and also with each other. So I observe where eye level is going to be and I just add some figures all the way along. I'm being careful to align their heads and their feet on the correct perspective lines. Now if this is all correct, then the figures proportionately should fit in front of the windows the same. They should be covering the same amount of window, but we see the ones up the end look a lot smaller than the ones closest to us on the left. And there doesn't seem to be a correct correlation between those closest ones and even the ones in the middle. So the scale is not working here properly, which is always an indication that something's not right with the perspective. Let's now add some figures to these two walls. And we'll add them with the same principle of aligning the heads and the feet on the correct perspective lines. It's much easier to keep these figures looking consistent with the scale of the wall. Let's see how it works with this more extreme perspective in our final wall. With this perspective, we're actually looking down a little bit on these figures. Again, it's much easier here to draw the figures so that there seems to be a consistent scale across the whole front of the wall, regardless of how far away from us it is. This is a sure indication that the perspective is pretty much spot on. But this isn't just a technique for putting windows into walls. It can be used for any repeated architectural element to ensure that the foreshortening, the visual compression as the wall moves or the building moves further away from us is correct. So let me apply this same technique to spacing seven columns correctly. Now there's no wall, but I'm going to do my first and final lines as being the center line of the columns. I do my diagonal, I do my seven equal spaced dots to indicate the seven columns. And now where those lines drawn to the vanishing point cut through the diagonal is going to be the center of my seven columns. The important thing when drawing elements such as this is that we keep the proportions correct. And the biggest temptation is that we make the columns pretty much the same width as we go along. In fact, the columns have to get thinner and thinner as they get shorter and shorter so that the proportions stay correct. Otherwise, it will send a confusing message to our brains as to either what the building looks like or what the perspective angle truly is. And that's why drawings where the perspective isn't quite right end up looking a bit awkward, even when it's not clear why, because it's like we've got the patterns of three different sets of perspectives all incorporated into the one drawing. But we can see now that these columns are spaced rather nicely, and we can in fact imagine them in front of a building or wrapping around a building. So this is a great system for any repeated architectural elements that we need to place correctly. G'day, I'm Stephen Travers. I hope this has been helpful in helping to work out just one more of those complex things that can involve perspective. So why not give it a go if this is an issue for you? See ya.